Hello, Professor Sinjab. Um, I don't know if you know about uh, Mazin. Actually, Mazin uh, is a great teacher. He probably one of the very few people who spend a lot of their own time, even including personal time, teaching other surgeons, other trainees, um, various things in cornea, ocular surface, uh, uh, topography, etc. Obviously, nobody can uh, ignore uh, how many books Mazin published and collaboration with so many organizations, societies, uh, courses, all about around cornea and understanding cornea topography. And definitely, he, he, he had a lot of, uh, changed a lot of landmarks, uh, understanding, uh, interpretation, uh, topography, cornea topography on various levels. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that he, he's, he uh, taught more than 7,500 hours. So he, uh, <laughs> I think that's a lot of, of commitment, obviously, dear teacher. So with a great pleasure, uh, I invite Mazin uh, um, uh, to speak today. Obviously, I have to say this has been very popular webinar. This is our first webinar. Uh, the minute a lot of colleagues heard that Professor Sinjab is joining us, I think we got so many people applied within the next few minutes from the minute we advertised this webinar. So um, I wish you all the best for this evening and we'll start with Professor Sinjab. Uh, please welcome. Thank you very much, everybody. And I would like to congratulate Samer for uh, creating this Cornea Club. And I'm sure that it will be one of the uh, uh, most eminent uh, clubs uh, around the world because of such an eminent leader, Dr. Samer. Thank you for your very kind introduction and I hope that I meet your expectation and meet the expectation of uh, the, all the audience. So for the sake of time, I'm going to start the, um, uh, the presentation. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Perfect. So you can see my screen now. Okay, great. Um, okay. Uh, the outlines of this talk are, I'm going to go through the principles, some of the principles of coronal tomography to make it very easy uh, for all to understand. Then I will go to skillful, skillful interpretation uh, systematic one and evidence-based and finally I will finalize with how to uh, figure out the tomographical features of ectopic corneal diseases and to differentiate this from other entities that may be misdiagnosed as ectopic corneal diseases. Okay starting with the principles we all know the optical features of the cornea the cornea has two surfaces, anterior and posterior, which differ in their curvature. And it has a thickness that differs between the center and the periphery. To have an idea about the power of the cornea, let's imagine that we have a flat land on the left and a steep land on the right. For sure, the steep, right, the steep land on the right has more power is stronger than the one on the left. Elevations and depressions. The cornea has elevations and depressions very similar to the mountains. In addition, there is a general shape of the cornea. The general shape describes the overall shape of the cornea regardless of the tiny details in every part of the cornea very similar to these two mountains. The one on the left is flat, the one on the right is steep, regardless of the details in these two mountains. The thickness, as we said, the cornea has a central thickness, which is thinner, usually thinner than, whenever it is normal, of course, thinner than the periphery. To measure the cornea, there must be some devices there are two groups of devices, the topographers and the tomographers. In order to know the difference between these two groups of devices, we have to know that the topographers 
describe the surface features, only the surface. They don't go into deep details. So they describe the anterior surface of the cornea, including the tear film. But they can never do any evaluation of the thickness of the cornea or the posterior corneal um, surface. On the other hand, the tomographers give full details from the anterior and posterior corneal surfaces in addition to corneal thickness. In addition, the new devices or the new technology of tomographers are OCT based, giving anterior OCT in addition to layer differentiation of the stroma and the epithelium. So they give epithelial mapping and stroma lap, uh, mapping, which play a very important role in early detection of keratoconus and for refractive surgery planning as well. Now, we have to measure corneal power, corneal elevations, corneal slope, which is the overall shape of the cornea, and corneal thickness, in addition, of course, to which a part of is the corneal epithelium. Starting with the corneal power, very simply, the corneal power is expressed as curvature map. So whenever we say corneal power, it is curvature map. The curvature map is measured either by the keratometric method or by the Snell's law. We come to the corneal elevations. The difference between our globe, the eye, and our globe, the earth, is on the earth, there is a reference surface called the sea level, while in the globe or the cornea, there is no sea level. Therefore, the computer will create a reference surface with, and fits this surface to the corneal surface, to the measured corneal surface, in a way and in a position, depending on some parameters. According to that, all parts of the corneal surface which are above the reference surface are given plus values and expressed in hot colors and vice versa. To understand the difference between the power and the elevation, let's assume that this is one of the corneal surfaces, the anterior corneal surface. And we have measured the power of this corneal surface. As you see on the right, the numbers are low, 40 diopters, because this part is flat and the part on the left is steep so it has 48 and 50 diopters now the same corneal surface is going to be measured as elevation maps the computer will create a reference surface and fits this surface to the corneal surface according to that in the position okay this is the position those on the left are above so they are given plus and those on the right are below so they are giving given negative but what if the same reference surface changes its position okay let's assume that now it takes this position now as you see all the numbers are in positive and if it goes um, in this position then all the numbers will be displayed in negative now, the shape of the reference surface affects the display of the values as well. As you see here, this is a flat reference surface, which will make all values are high and positive, while this is a steep reference surface, which makes all values in negative. So as you see, the elevations are relative. To reference surface so they can change based on the diameter based on the position and based on the shape of the reference surface while the power is something fixed that that is not relevant to anything or relative to anything now measuring the corneal slope when we measure the corneal slope we aim at describe the shape of the cornea, the overall shape of the cornea. But what is the over sh overall shape of the cornea? It is a conoid uh, shape. What is the conoid shape? It is a combination of ellipsoid and aspheric. The base of the cornea is not 
uh, a circle. It is not circular. It is ellipsoid base because the horizontal diameter of the cornea is larger than the vertical diameter of the cornea. And the side face of the cornea is not a part of a sphere. It is just aspheric or dome. So this combination is called conoid. Okay, what's the benefit of this? The benefit is now we can understand why some corneas have astigmatism while some corneas do not. When there is astigmatism, it means that it is ellipsoid, ellipsoid base, resulting in with the rule astigmatism. When the vertical meridian is the steep one, against the rule astigmatism, when the horizontal meridian is the steep one, or oblique astigmatism. So this is an expression of the ellipsoid base, which is, which is known as corneal toricity. At the same time, when the cornea takes different shapes of asphericity, then there will be different types of spherical aberrations because spherical aberrations are induced by the corneal asphericity. We come to corneal thickness. There are four types of maps that describe corneal thickness. All are important and all should be studied. The uh, general thickness map, including the epithelium. The relative thickness map, which is the thickness map, but compared with the average thickness map of the normative data, normal population. So the computer will compare it with the normative data and then will uh, display it as a relative thickness map, giving it plus or minus values. Plus means that those parts are above normal, and minus, which means that those parts are below normal thickness of uh, normative data. The stromal thickness map is the rest of the of the cornea without the epithelium, and the epithelial map uh, by itself. All right. Now we come to the skillful interpretation. Why do we need a skillful interpretation for corneal tomography? Actually, it is not only for refractive surgery. Modern cataract surgery depends a lot on a skillful interpretation of corneal tomography. For example, to use toric IOL or not to use toric IOL, to implant aspheric IOL or spheric IOL, to choose the side uh, the site of the incision, for example, to modify the astigmatism, to, to do AK, to detect whether the cornea is irregular before the cataract surgery. Number three is to detect and classify ectetic corneal diseases, as we are going to see. So it is not only detection, it is to classify those. Uh, not, I'm not talking about the severity of ectetic corneal disease. I'm talking about classifying and differentiating between different entities of ectetic corneal diseases because each entity has its own way of management. And of course, to go for differ differential diagnosis of irregular astigmatism because in many cases, many of the irregular astigmatism cases are misinterpreted as ectetic corneal diseases. Now, before going to skillful interpretation, we have to know what's the meaning of steep and what's the meaning of flat? What's the meaning of symmetric and what's the meaning of asymmetric? What's the meaning of thin and what's the meaning of thick cornea? Because these are general expressions and there must be a common language. When I say steep, then it is something standard that all of us should refer to. And this applies for all other expressions. Now. If you see, uh, if you look at the map on the top, you will find a curvature map, which is which has a KM, which is the mean K of the anterior corneal surface. It is about 42.9 diopters, which is around 43. This is the average population. The average population, 43 diopters. Now, if you look on the bottom right, then you will find steep cornea it is 46, so above 43. And if you look at the bottom left, you will find flat cornea. The one on the right is after hyperopic treatment. And the one on the left 
is after myopic treatment. This is 40, almost 39 diopters. Now we come to the symmetric and asymmetric. The one on the top is symmetric, bow tie. Of course, because it is vertical, it is with the rule astigmatism. Those on the bottom are asymmetric. All right, they are asymmetric. The one on the right is skewed radial axis. There is an angulation between the upper and lower part of the, of the uh, bow tie. And uh, with the one on the left, it is the whole, uh, uh, it is a cone, inferior cone of the cornea. What is thin and what is thick? The one on the top is the normal, the average corneal thickness in normal population, which is between 500 and 550. The one on the top, uh, the, on the bottom right is a thick cornea, which triggers a warning sign of Fuchs dystrophy. While the one on the left is a thin cornea, which might be, might be, not necessarily, might be an indicator of uh, ectasia, might be, but not a hallmark. So this is the map that we are going to study. A lot of uh, maps and a lot of parameters. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Professor Njab. This is an amazing introduction, obviously. Um, so as you explained, there's so many values and uh, parameters. And I think that what comes to the, um, especially trainees when they start looking at those corneal topography say, right, okay, we learn the textbooks. This is a steep, this is a flat, we understand the principle, but how can we put things together? How can this all fit into clinical diagnosis, guide the treatment? And uh, there's so many, actually, the, obviously, you know, there are thousands of, of numbers and stats here on those maps. What's the best way and which number is really important that I look for and, and help me in my clinical practice? Yeah, that's very important, Sandra. Thank you very much. Actually, it's very, very simple. I'm going to show you the parameters that you, everybody should look at. They are just maybe less than um, the number of our fingers. Okay. So the first thing is we have to study the maps and some values. The thing that the the other thing which is very important is to compare both eyes. We have to do what is called inter-eye asymmetry study based on these five parameters. Okay, we compare both eyes in terms of these five parameters. Whenever there is a difference, we give, for example, a point or a score out of five. If the score is three and below, so let's say one, two, three, it means that there is insignificant inter-eye asymmetry. But it is, if it is four or five, then it is a warning sign because inter-eye asymmetry is one of the features of abnormal corneas. Okay, before I tell you how I study the maps, I'm going to ask some questions to the audience. So let's start the polls. The first question. So what we will do, we will start with some a uh, bit more general, just to grasp an idea of uh, what is the audience who is watching us uh, like. So okay. our, first, uh, uh, our first question is, what is your ophthalmology grade? And you've got a few seconds for that. Right, so, well, we've got a variety of grades and different backgrounds, but I think the majority is probably residents in ophthalmology and consultants in general ophthalmology. Good. So this will be our next question. Do you feel the need for a cornea club that focus on, focuses on spreading knowledge, exchanging ideas, networking with professionals in this subspecialist field? And let's see what you think about that. And let's see. 
So, well, that's wow. quite impressive. All of you, apart from one, <laughs> think of you should have that. Okay. Nice. Let's go to the next one. So third question, how often shall we run the Cornea Club webinars? What do you think? We would really value your opinion on that, as it is our first session today. Good, and let's see what uh, we've got there. So actually, most of you agree with our initial plan to do it uh, on a monthly basis, so thank you for that. And now we will move on to the cornea questions that Professor Sinjab uh, suggested. So what is, according to your opinion, the least important tomographic feature of keratoconus? Corneal stiffening, corneal thinning, or corneal asymmetry? We've got a few seconds for that. It's the least. Yes, <laughs> the least. <laughs> okay, and let's see. So 53% think that it's corneal thinning, Professor Sinja. Okay, great. Actually, this is the correct answer. Yes, the least important, corneal thinning. It means that the audience were listening uh, carefully to what I uh, introduced. Okay, great. Now we go to the second question, please. Mm -hmm. So uh, before the second question, uh, I, I want to show the golden rule behind this. The first golden rule is do not be distracted by a thin cornea. Okay, what is the second question now? Uh, the, sorry, the second rule is do not be deceived by a thick cornea because a thick cornea might be not normal, might be abnormal. Okay, now, as you see here, this is the case of keratoconus, okay, with a thick cornea. Look at the uh, thickness map. It is a thick cornea and almost a normal thickness cornea. While this is a case of very normal, very symmetric cornea, but it is normally thin, all right? So thickness is not an indicator of ectopic corneal disease. Great. Now we go to the second question. So the second question is, which one of the following would indicate a possible keratoconus? High symmetric with the rule astigmatism, Thickened epithelium over a suspected cone, increased posterior corneal elevation. So we've got a few seconds for that too. Okay. Right. So 82% of you suggest that it's the increased posterior corneal elevation. Very good. Thank you. So the answer, yes, it is the increased posterior corneal elevation is a very important indicator of possible keratoconus. So the third rule is evaluate the posterior surface because ectasia starts there. As you see here, this is a case of keratoconus. The posterior uh, elevation map is abnormal while the anterior elevation map is normal. Rule number four, high symmetric astigmatism is an indicator of nothing. So one of the misconcepts is high astigmatism is an indicator of ectasia or indicator of keratoconus, or some surgeons may, may not do uh, refractive surgery to a patient with high astigmatism just because of the fear of development of ectasia after refractive surgery, which is incorrect. Now we come to the uh, third question. So our third question is, in screening for refractive surgery, the most suspicious sign is thin cornea, stiff cornea, or asymmetric cornea. Okay, and let's see. So 74% uh, say that is the asymmetric cornea. Very good. Yeah, this is the correct answer. The asymmetric cornea is the most suspicious sign. Great. So look for any clue of real asymmetry. 
we come to this question now. So we proceed with the next one, which is, which of the following is correct? The earliest sign of ectasia is posterior surface asymmetry. Focal epithelial thinning is the earliest sign of ectasia or the early sign of ectasia is corneal thinning? What do you think? Okay, and let's see. Right. This is a tricky question. 75% uh, feel that is the, the earliest sign of ectasia is um, uh, posterior elevation. Wow. I'm really amazed because they know the answers, the correct answers. <laughs> Very good. Obviously, your yes. teaching being spreading around, the Professor Sinjar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy with this, actually. Yeah, the earliest sign of ectasia is posterior surface asymmetry, as we will see later. Okay, great. So always look for any posterior corneal asymmetry. Now we come to this question. So that's the last one. Uh, what is the best map to detect abnormalities on posterior corneal surface? The sagittal curvature map, tangential curvature map, or posterior elevation map? What do you think? Okay, let's see. So 90% feel it's the posterior elevation map. Okay, unfortunately, this is the right answer, the tangential curvature, the posterior tangential curvature map, as we will see later. Very good. Okay, so always study the posterior surface by tangential map, in addition to elevation map, of course. Okay, perfect. Now, this is the answer. Why is that? Because this is a case of early keratoconus. There is early keratoconus. There is a focal thinning in the epithelium and a bulging and asymmetry on the posterior tangential curvature map, as you see on the bottom left. The one in the middle, bottom middle, it is a posterior elevation map, but uh, as you see, uh, it doesn't show a real asymmetry. So sometimes the asymmetry will appear on the tangential, posterior tangential map earlier than on the posterior elevation map. This is why the posterior tangential map is important in studying such cases early keratoconus. Okay, great. Now, this is a question just on the pictures, so no poll. Now, do you think this one is normal? You can put your answer in the chat. If you think it is normal, just put N. If it is abnormal, just put A. Perfect. Very interactive group. I'm happy with this. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Now, the second question is, is this abnormal or normal? If you feel this is abnormal, put A, otherwise you put N. Now everybody will put A now. <laughs> In the previous one, some put N, some put A. Great, great. Ah, there is one who put N. Okay, great. Actually, now I'm going to answer. These two maps are just for the same cornea. So this is the rule. Do not be distracted or deceived by the colors. Actually, they are just the same map, but I played with the color scale. The, the one on the right, I played with the color scale in order to hide, okay? Uh, the the details. So this is why you cannot see details. The one on the left, I played with the color scale in order to exaggerate, to highlight more the irregularities. If you look at the numbers, they are just the same pattern and same numbers. All right, so it is just the same cornea, but with different colors. 
So this is why we must not look at colors. We must not be distracted by colors. And we must not be reassured by homogeneous colors, let's say. Okay, great. Now, this is the answer to the question of Dr. Sanner. We look at this map, just we have to study the KM, which is the mean K of the anterior corneal surface, thinnest location. We look at the anterior curvature map for two things, the superior inferior asymmetry, and if there is any skew or uh, angulation between in the, in the inner part of the uh, symmetric bowtie. And then we look at the elevation maps using the uh, diameter of eight millimeter, as I will uh, mention later, but we look at the values corresponding to the thinnest location, okay? If you see those circles in the center, almost in the center, they are the symbols of thinnest location. We look at the numbers corresponding to the thinnest location, and uh, we compare it with um, a table. Uh, I'll show it to you later. In addition, we look at the pattern of the corneal thickness map. We don't look at numbers in the corneal thickness map. We just look at the pattern. Great. And uh, I'm going now to very quickly to uh, present the cut of values, but don't bother yourself now to memorize these numbers because we are not going to use them uh, in the lecture. Uh, I'm going to send, send you later um, a table which contains all the cut of values and the classification of the cut of uh, values. But um, what I aim here is to show you the evidence based of these numbers. So as I told you, this is the KM, and we have to look at the thinnest location. Now, I have a comment here for the thinnest location that this is population based. Um, based on some publications, uh, less than 2.5% of normal population have less than 470 microns, okay? But this may differ according to population. For example, example in, the, in North Africa, the thickness of the cornea is less than this in normal population. So you have to take your population into consideration before considering this point. As I told you, in the curvature map, we have to look at the inferior superior asymmetry. If you have the um, IS as here in the, displayed in the pentacam or in other machines, otherwise you can make it, you can do it uh, manually. For example, you look at the two opposing points at the steep axis in the four millimeter zone and you see the difference, all right? Now, the difference, the, these are the cut of values evidence-based as well. Now we come to the skewed radial axis. It is an angulation between the inferior and superior segment of the bow tie. Either it is symmetric bow tie or asymmetric bow tie. However, we consider this significant when the topographical astigmatism is 1.5 diopters or more. But if it is less, then even if it is more than 21 degrees, we don't consider it. We ignore it. As in this case, as you see, it is more than 21 degrees, but the astigmatism is 0 0.4 diopters. So it is nothing. We come to the elevation maps. We have to study the elevation maps in two methods. The first one is the Bell and Ambrosio method. And the other one is Jack Holiday method. The Bell and Ambrosio method is to use the best fit sphere, eight millimeter diameter. And we look at the thinnest location. Then we follow the three standard deviation table, which I simplify into these cutoff numbers. All right. In the myopic or emetropic people, the anterior surface cutoff value is plus eight, the posterior surface cutoff value is plus 18. And for the hyperopic and mixed astigmatism, plus seven for the anterior and plus 28 for the posterior. This is the Belen Ambrosio method. Now the Jack Holiday method uses the best fit toric ellipsoid rather than best fit sphere. 
and it looks at all numbers within the central five centi uh, uh, millimeter. Um, the cutoff value is 12 plus 12 for the anterior and plus 18, uh, 15 plus 12 for anterior plus 15 for posterior. We come to the corneal thickness map. It should be concentric. Otherwise, if it is dome shaped, droplet, bell shaped, globus, it is abnormal. And don't forget to compare both eyes. Great. Now we'll take an example. Let's assume that we have this um, for the right eye, and this one is for the left eye. Now we want to, to see whether we can do uh, refractive surgery to the patient or not. Of course, I'm not going to uh, present the calculations regarding the care readings, the PTA, the residual stromal bed, all of this. No, I'm going to just study the tomography itself, whether it is okay or not. Before I study, I have to validate the capture. If the capture is not, uh, does not meet the criteria, I have to reject it. I have to ask the technician to repeat it. This is very important before I study. How I validate it by um, be sh being sure that the settings are standardized and to look at the quality specification, it should be white okay. And then I compare the pupil coordinates in order to figure out whether the patient was fixating well during taking the capture or uh, maybe there was some misalignment. Now let's see how to, to be sure that everything is fine. First of all, we look at the periphery of all maps. If I see black dots, this means that there are some extrapolated data, which means that the computer couldn't, or the camera couldn't take capture of those parts, so the computer um, extrapolated those areas, assumed those areas, which is inaccurate, of course. So if I see black dots, I have to exclude it. Number two, it's better to go for the nine millimeter display. Number three, I have to be sure that the best fit sphere or the best toric ellipsoid, they should be an eight millimeter, not more and not less. And the quality specification, as you see on the left, it should be white. Okay, great. This is for the right eye and this is for the left eye. So at this point, they are accepted. Now, the third, uh, step in validation is to compare the coordinates of the pupil of the right eye and the left eye. To make it very simple, just memorize this rule. X plus X, algeb algebraic sum of X plus X, and Y minus Y. If plus X, um, sorry, if X plus X is less than 200 microns and Y minus Y less than 200 microns, then there was very good alignment during taking the capture and we can accept it. So let's apply this. As you see here for this, uh, for, uh, this patient, the X plus X is minus 30 microns, which is less than 200. Y minus Y is minus 40 microns, which is less than 200. Great. Now, what about the other? Um, after validation, let's apply the parameters. It is just a warning sign regarding the thickness, okay? Although it is 480 and it is normal, but it is a warning sign regarding some types of refractive surgery. Otherwise, as you see here, everything with a normal. This is for the right eye, and this is the um, anterior best fit toric ellipsoid, because in this map, I showed the best fit sphere. We have to study the best fit toric ellipsoid for the anterior and for the posterior, and all are normal. And this is for the left eye. In the left eye, 469, the thinnest location. So there is a yellow uh, flag, but otherwise everything is fine. And if we look at the inter eye asymmetry, we will find that it is two out of five score. So it is accepted. Now, any questions so far? Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Mazin, Prof. Mazin, can I ask, uh, there's no mention to K-Max, where is it gone? 
Because yeah. if some people keep talking about KMAX all the time. Yeah, very good question. Actually, I searched all the lit literature regarding the KMAX. I couldn't find any evidence based of cutoff values. No cutoff values for the KMAX. This is why I took it off I, from, from uh, my criteria. Yeah. That's fine. And um, we, the other question is back to the X plus X, Y minus Y. Is mm -hmm. that already taken into consideration when you have um, quality standardization? I mean, does the Pentacam automatically check that or that is, you still can't see no. okay with the normal Y? Yeah, you can see that. Very mm -hmm. good, very good. Yeah, the um, QS, uh, if it is white, okay, it doesn't mean it is okay. Many cases we find misalignment with a very white okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we have to check it uh, ourselves, yeah. Perfect. And uh, the last question, because I, I want you to carry on with your uh, interesting talk. Uh, uh, you know, when you talked about the thickness maps, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned that there is a variation depends on the race, population, etc. Would you that you take that into consideration when you plan a surgery? So for example, someone coming for refractive surgery, LASIK, for example, do you say, well, I won't go below 500 regardless of your race and on population? Very good. Uh, yes, uh, um, it should be, it should depend on the, on the population. For example, if I work in North Africa, then uh, maybe um, if uh, the patient is 480, I would go for LASIK, okay? But maybe if in the Gulf area or for example, in Syria, if the patient is below four, uh, below 500, I will not go for LASIK because usually the corneas here are thick. So yeah, okay. my decision will depend. Excellent. I mean, uh, would you say you would rather go on the extra cautious side? Because I mean, we all surgeons, we love cutting corneas, we love using our examer lasers all the time. And I, yeah. I'm, my concern that some people take it as, all right, okay, <laughs> you are North African, I'm gonna go with yeah. it, like you are 470s, <laughs> might be okay. So yeah. just, you have to be careful with that, right? Yeah. Yes, hmm. yeah, I agree with you. Hmm. I agree with you, yeah. yeah. Okay, so obviously we have a lot of questions from the audience. Do you like to answer now or shall we leave it at the end? Um, let's go on with the, uh, with the presentation because okay. there are some very important points now, then we can stop. That might answer the okay, question. Great. Yeah, very good. Now, uh, I want you to know the difference between these entities uh, in terms of corneal tomography. And to make it very simple, uh, I just, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus only on five entities, the keratoconus, form first keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration, keratoglobus, and the ectasia that may occur after laser vision correction. Uh, to say that this is keratoconus, it must have, the cornea must have, abnormal anterior curvature map and abnormal posterior elevation map, such as in this case. The anterior curvature is very obvious that it's abnormal, and the posterior elevation, look at the number corresponding to the thinnest location, it is plus 31, which is very high. So this is keratoconus, and by the way, Look at the thickness map. It's very, very normal, and the cornea is very thick, 578 in the center. Okay? Now, while this cornea is thin, but very symmetric and very normal. Now, we come to the form frost keratoconus. Just remove that the posterior elevation is abnormal. Just remove it. So, you will have abnormal anterior curvature. If you have only abnormal anterior curvature map, then we can say this is form frost keratoconus. But there is another expression, which is called the keratoconus suspect, which is not a suspect of keratoconus, okay? A suspect of keratoconus, it means that you have a doubt that this case is a keratoconus. But keratoconus suspect is an entity called keratoconus suspect expression, right? which is characterized by abnormal anterior curvature only. It is very similar to form frost keratoconus. So what is the difference between form frost keratoconus and keratoconus suspect? The difference is if the other eye has keratoconus, then we say that this is form frost keratoconus. If the other eye is normal, 
or maybe abnormal, but not a frank keratoconus, then we call this is keratoconus suspect. All right. Look, uh, uh, look at the posterior elevation. It is very, very normal. Yes, Dr. Samer. Yeah, so what about those cases, they call them unilateral keratoconus. Do you believe there is such thing like unilateral keratoconus? Uh, actually, we all know that keratoconus is a bilateral case, but I think uh, Professor Bellin presented uh, maybe two years ago, two cases of unilateral keratoconus, which were observed over maybe eight years or something like this, and the other eye stayed very, very normal. However, uh, maybe if we check the biomechanics of that, of the, uh, of the uh, apparently normal eye, it will show the same features of keratoconus. So I do believe that keratoconus is bilateral. Okay. Yeah. And in your definition or keratoconus suspect and forms through keratoconus, would that still be applied when you have a biomechanical studies? If you have a corvus, for example? Um, very good. Now, um, this will bring me to the action that I have to take whenever I, I, uh, I see a form frost keratoconus, okay? Because either tomographically or biomechanically, if I, if I diagnose something, then I have to take an action. The action either to just observe or maybe to go for cross-linking, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about this. Thank you. All right. So as you see, this case is a form frost keratoconus because the right eye has only abnormality on the curvature map, while the other eye shows frank keratoconus. This is a case of keratoconus suspect. This is an expression, okay? This is not a doubt of keratoconus. It is an expression. But as you see, both uh, eyes show abnormal anterior curvature map, but the posterior elevation map is very, very normal. All right, so this is keratoconus suspect. Okay, pellucid marginal degeneration, you will find abnormal anterior curvature, abnormal posterior elevation, okay? But the whole mark here is the bell sign on the thickness map. The bell sign means that there is an inferior thinning in the cornea, which is a hallmark of pellucid marginal degeneration, right? This is the inferior part of the cornea, very thin. This is pellucid marginal degeneration. We come to keratoglobus. You will find abnormal anterior curvature, abnormal posterior elevation, but there is a generalized thinning and generalized steepening of the cornea. This is why it is keratoglobus. Okay, this is a case of keratoglobus. Ectasia after laser vision correction, it may take any shape of that, keratoconus or pellucid, okay, but there is a history of laser vision correction, of course. Now I want to I want to ask you, ask the audience, what do you think this case? Are you going to show the other eye? <laughs> uh, no, this, this, only this eye. <laughs> because it is very clear. Yeah, it is keratoconus actually. Yeah, good. And what about this eye? Very good. And of course, this, this eye, keratoconus as well. What about this one? Very good. Very good. No, it's not normal, of course. We have to look at the other eye. This is either form frost keratoconus if the other eye has keratoconus, or this is keratoconus suspect because the posterior elevation map is normal. Very good. This is the other eye. Okay, this is the right and this is the left. So it is keratoconus suspect. What about this one?
yes. No, no, it is not in keratoglobus. It is, no, not keratoconus. Pellucid marginal degeneration, inferior thinning. This is another case of pellucid marginal degeneration, inferior thinning. Very good. Sometimes in early stages of pellucid marginal degeneration, you may not see the bell sign typically, but you will find like a melting, melting sign of the, of the uh, thickness map, as you see, it is melting downward. Okay. Uh, we come to the action. If there is keratoconus or any of these entities, what shall we do? There are two actions, of course. Either immediate cross-linking, if other parameters are met, or we have to document progression. So for keratoconus, put D if you want to uh, document progression, or C if you want to do cross-linking. D or C, cross-linking. Depends on age. Cross-linking depends. Okay, great. Very good. What do you mean yes. by documenting? Uh, progression, uh, yeah. Uh, to monitor. To monitor yeah. progression. If, if, yeah. if, if you got, uh, like in the UK, we have uh, very good optometrists. They're under good service. And all of them monitor the patient. And I tell you, they have a progressive astigmatism. And mm -hmm. you see those patients in the clinic and they diagnose as a keratoconus. This is a question is, is would you treat or you want to document, meaning like, are you relying on previous, there is a progression, there is evidence progression as per the optometrist, or you want to see a pentacam progression or topography progression by doing interval ones? Which way you would yeah. do? Actually, there are two ways to document progression, either to depend on tomography or to depend on biomechanics or both, all right? because biomechanics may show you that the cornea is become softer, okay? And um, the Pentacam or any other uh, machine can show you some parameters. I'm going to talk about the progression criteria now, just in brief. Okay, very good question, very good answers. The keratoconus, of course, depends on age and depends on severity, uh, corneal thickness and which stage it is, and depends on uh, documenting progression uh, in most of the time. So uh, actually, in general, we can say that we have to document progression in keratoconus. And for sure, we have to document progression for form frost keratoconus. We have to go for cross-linking immediately in pellucid marginal degeneration because it is progressive regardless of the age. Now, for keratoglobus, there is a controversy. Some may say, yeah, do cross-linking because it is progressive. Some may say, no, it is just a deformity, congenital deformity of the cornea. So just uh, document progression. So there is a controversy. And of course, Dr. Samer can, can tell us about this. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Samer, regarding keratoglobus? Yes, I agree with you. I mean, I will, uh, yes, definitely cross-linking. I will add the uh, uh, pediatric keratoconus cross-linking as well without... Uh, mm -hmm documentation for long term yeah. yeah exactly without yes very good and post laser vision correction ectasia it must be cross-linked immediately great now documenting progression the best way is to use the Bellin abcd keratoconus staging which is on the pentacam it will show you the stage and then you may see the patient after three months or six months and then you capture the patient and then it will show you whether there is a, a progression or not and it may show you as a graph. Of course, I'm not going to uh, explain this graph because it takes a lot of time, but however, this is the best way in order to, to uh, check progression. However, if you don't have it, then you have to depend manually. If you want to go manually, then you have to take three captures per visit, okay? And the three captures uh, should be taken, um, and then you take the median of these three captures and you compare it with the median of the three captures in the next visit if there is a change in the k max more than 1.5 diopters and thinning in the cornea more than 15 microns then yes it is progression if one of them is it might be an artifact and in order to get a very accurate 
uh, measurements, um, it is strongly recommended to have the same observer, the same technician uh, to do it for every visit. Now, this is a case of progression, just comparing the thinnest location that is thinning more than 20 uh, um, of 20 microns. The K-max increased plus 1.9 diopters, so there is progression. I'm going to skip this, but I have to highlight the behavior of the epithelium in ectasia. Usually the ectasia starts on the posterior uh, on the posterior corneal surface. It bulges out, then this will go to the anterior corneal surface. It will bulge out as well, but the epithelium will thin in order to compensate for that and keep the surface regular, as in this case. Now, whenever the bulging increases and the uh, keratoconus advances, the bulging on the anterior corneal surface will increase as well, and it will reach a point out of the capacity of the epithelium. Therefore, the epithelium will be, will show very, very irregularity, very focal thinning or a generalized thinning. And this will be reflected on the anterior corneal surface as irregularity. So whenever you see an irregularity on the anterior corneal surface, it means that uh, the irregularity, sub-epithelial irregularity has reached a point that it that is out of the capacity of the epithelium to compensate for. There are four models of uh, epithelial behavior, either focal thinning, such as in this case, or inferior superior thinning, um, uh, or um, sorry, asymmetry. I mean that asymmetry, okay, inferior superior asymmetry, radial thinning, this is one of the patterns, and generalized thinning. These four patterns characterize the uh, behavior of the epithelium and keratoconus. The final thing is you have to put in mind that irregularities may uh, result from corneal wipers due to contact lenses, corneal scars, previous corneal surgeries, severe dry eye uh, disease, or ocular surface diseases. So put those entities in mind or causes in mind before judging that, okay, this is keratoconus, let's hurry to uh, cross-linking. This is a case of decentered optical zone. Sometimes it is misinterpreted as inferior steepening of the cornea. And this is post-hyperopic treatment, which is very normal cornea, but some may think that this is keratoconus. This is after graft irregularities. This is after intracorneal rings, which Dr. Samer hate. <laughs> you hate intracorneal rings. And this is a hotspot induced by um, contact lens. This is a scar. So let me ask you, uh, this cornea, what do you think that this patient has? Very good. Post myopic. Yeah, exactly. And this one post myopic. And what about this? Yeah, it is a scar actually. Yes. The scar is here in the, I wonder if I can use the notation, maybe not. Okay, the scar here, it is in the, in the flat area, in the blue area on the curvature map, okay, on the curvature map, corresponding to the very thinning in the corneal thickness map and out bulging of the posterior elevation map. These are true actually, but sometimes these may be, um, um, false because the scar may be dense enough to prevent the light from getting through and the computer will think that this is a thin cornea and maybe there is uh, out bulging so the scar may give different types of misleading features okay this is the last question because i know that the time is uh, over 
So what do you think this patient has? Look at the bell sign, but it is inverted bell sign. Is it a rare case, case report of inverted pellucid marginal regeneration? Yeah, of course, we have to repeat image because of the extrapolated, very good. We repeated the image and this is the image again. Okay, actually, this is a superior pathology in the cornea, okay? Pathology in the superior part of the cornea. This patient has pathology because of VKC, okay? So there is a pathology in the upper part of the cornea. So the computer thinks that this is uh, an area of irregularity and an area of thinning. So of course, in order to get good one, we have to treat the VKC we have to lubricate the cornea, and then we have to repeat the, uh, the capture. Okay, this is the last, last question. <laughs> okay, what do you think this cornea has? Is it normal? Good. Yeah, I presented this just to show you that even if we have symmetric high astigmatism, it might be a normal cornea, all right? Not necessarily to be an ectasia or to be a keratoconus. Uh, and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor Mazin. Uh, I was saying just uh, you have this, uh, what do you call it, the skills, and the passion you make any topic very interesting and i have to say thank even you. those who never interest in in topography you make them now start to think about actually i want to learn more about corneal topography great thank great, you very great much. Talk. so let's let's go through some questions uh yes, i'll just yes. have to, a couple of things to finish what we started earlier so mm -hmm. you know when you talked about your criteria for uh, assessment you didn't mention you said thickness does not matter to start with do I get to try that for, for monitoring progression of keratoconus, for example, thinning becoming important to you and K-max becoming important to you, which are not key in the, when you do the screening bit? Yes. Is that correct? Accurate? Yeah, but mm. uh, actually, I have a full chapter in my book of, uh, of to topography, corneal tomography in clinical practice, the, four, the fourth edition. Mm -hmm. I have a full chapter discussing in detail uh, all the criteria of progression that were mentioned in the literature, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of criteria. Mm -hmm. And I showed in this discussion and um, in the chapter what is with and what is against, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right? There is nothing with strongly very strongly and or let's say there is no agreement about the criteria of progression mm -hmm. right but the k-max and the thinning they are let, let's say personal criteria personal criteria because i studied the the uh what we call the noise of the machine mm -hmm. when the cornea is distorted it gives a range of readings for the same cornea in the same session Mm -hmm. So there is a range of noise, which is almost 12, milli, uh, 12 microns for the thickness and almost 1.5 diopters for the K-max. Mm -hmm. And there is a paper that was published about the K-max itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From here, I took these two parameters and I put them together in order to say that there is progression. But however, you can take more than two parameters, three, four, five parameters. The more you take parameters, the better mm -hmm. in order to document progression if you don't have the software of the ABCD. Mm -hmm. But in general, there is no general agreement about the criteria of progression. Okay, just a couple of things on posterior elevation. Mm -hmm. Have you seen cases where you have only posterior elevation and nothing else wrong with the topography? And what does that yes. tell you sometimes? 
Yeah, actually, there is an entity called the posterior keratoconus. I didn't present it here just not to confuse the audience. Posterior keratoconus is of two types. Either it is unilateral or bilateral. If it is bilateral, usually it is a congenital deformity, and usually it does not develop and does not progress into keratoconus. Mm -hmm. While if it is on only unilateral or maybe bilateral but asymmetric, it should be considered as posterior keratoconus that may develop into frank keratoconus. That because we all know that any ectasia usually starts on the posterior surface. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have cases, I can show cases of posterior keratoconus, only posterior bulging on the uh, surface, posterior okay. surface. W would you think that could be an error sometimes if it's to do with the angle kappa or anything else during the capture? Um, yeah, now angle kappa causes skewing in the hourglass pattern. Okay, there is an hourglass pattern on the anterior and posterior elevation maps when the cornea is symmetric. Mm -hmm. But there will be skewing because of angle kappa. But it does not cause um, a central island with high numbers. Angle mm -hmm. kappa doesn't, doesn't induce uh, this severity, this extent. Excellent, excellent. And finally, then, when you choose your topographer, because a lot of people say, I have a topographer in my practice, but you can see that if you're not... Um, identify the shape, the posterior elevation, then you haven't, you missed a lot of information. Is that right? So, yeah. so definitely we're talking about, and would you have a, you don't have to say it, answer, would you have preference between kind of shim flung imaging or OCT guided topography? Now, uh, of course, the OCT based is the best now because it gives the stromal thickness, it gives the uh, epithelial thickness in addition to other maps in addition to anterior OCT, so all in one. Okay, excellent, yeah. excellent. Good, uh, I know there's a lot of questions. We'll try to answer as many as possible. So uh, yeah. Artemis, uh, would you mind just we go through some of the questions, please? Yeah, so there is a question from the audience uh, regarding our, the use of aura or corvus, as Mr. Hamada said earlier, in um, KC suspects. Do you, Professor Sinjab, use that in your practice? And the corvus. Yes, or aura. Ah, yeah, ah, aura, yeah. Um, the aura, yes, but the corvus, unfortunately, not yet. Mm -hmm. But I hope, I hope I have it, yes. I hope maybe in the future. Do, do you find it useful for um, keratoconus suspects patients? Do you incorporate that in your... Y yes, yeah. yeah. The biomechanics are very important, yes. Mm -hmm. um, some people ask, why did you mentioned that we need to go for a diameter of eight millimeters for the best fit um, uh, ellipsoid and uh, sphere or yeah or ellipsoid very good actually because this is the diameter the standard diameter that the studies were based on okay the normative data the cutoff values all were studied based on this diameter so if we go above or below then we cannot refer to uh, cutoff values or normative data mm -hmm. And uh, what role does the location of the thinnest point play in diagnosis as a species, as a species cornea? It's another question. Very good. Actually, I used to depend on this parameter, and there are published studies about this parameter, that if it is more than 500 microns, then it is suspicious. If it is more than 1,000 microns, it is for sure ectasia. But when I carried my own study in the center on about uh, maybe 80, 80 uh, individuals, uh, let's say, um, they were like um, uh, divided into two groups, very normal and those with keratoconus. I found insignificant, um, or let's say statistically insignificance between these two groups in terms of the displacement of the thinnest location. There were no difference. There was no difference. So. Um, at that point, I stopped depending on this criteria. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, there is a question which I suspect it, it uh, has to do with pediatric keratoconus. Is there an age cutoff point uh, after which we would uh, go for cross linking rather than monitoring? Uh, before 30, of course, this depends on the population as well. But in general, before 30, we can go for cross linking. Above 30, we have to go for documentation. Now, this cutoff age uh, differs from 
place to place, um, uh, surgeon to surgeon. Uh, in some populations, we can say above 30. Some, some population, we can say above 25, we can just monitor. So it depends. Mm -hmm. I think we've got um, a lot of questions, but I don't know if we have the time to go through all of them. Um, Mr. Hamada? I'm fine. For me, I'm free, but okay. it depends on your time. Yeah, I think let's carry on because it's a lot of good questions, I have to say. Shame not to answer yeah. them, especially we have uh, Prof. Mazin with us today. Thank you. So another question is, um, is the difference between Kmax and K2 still valid? This is one of the criteria, as I mentioned, that uh, some studies used to, to use, but uh, personally, I don't depend on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now, when would you call uh, a case of asymmetrical ectasia rather than form frust, KC? What, what's the terminology you would, um, you would prefer? Asymmetric ectasia rather. Yeah, terminology is something um, uh, often for everybody to, to, uh, to give a name for whatever. So, yeah, I think now uh, uh, Professor Ambrosio is giving this, this name to this from Frost Keratconus, rather. Uh, however, yeah, everybody can term it, but actually there must be an agreement. I, I think there must be a global consensus about terminology to, to have a common language. Yeah, I agree. You know, the, um, I agree with you on this point. There is a lot of confusion. And if you talk to people about the, the definitions, Form frost, keratoconus suspect, all that. There's a lot of confusion actually and interlap between yeah. what does it actually mean. Uh, the terms is not just a term. Actually, it means a lot for the monitoring of those patients and and treatment treatment itself. So yeah, yeah. I agree with you. And um, and and uh, following what you said earlier as well, and I agree that I don't think you can rely on just one two markers on topography. It's a whole collective of evidence you're building around the case to say, actually, I am convinced it's keratoconus I want to treat. And, and it's, it, that is important when you want to treat, like the cross-linking. But I think if you don't just uh, to do topograph, uh, sorry, do um, refractive surgery, laser recollection, then actually you look for one evidence to tell you not to operate, then <laughs> become as the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, are you still working with Rabinovich criteria in keratoconus assessment? Um. I think uh, the IS, the IS, inferior superior asymmetry is one of the Rabinovich uh, criteria. Yeah. And the skewed radial axis is one of the Rabinovich as well. Yeah. These two criteria are, yeah. And the uh, KM, by the way, the KM, the cutoff value of KM, which is the mean K of the anterior curvature map, which is 47.2 for placido based devices, is from Rabinovich as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you remember one 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 of the meeting we were chatting about the va the value of Q value? Yeah. Do you still look into that at the moment, or you don't think it's it's that much? Uh, Q value will give me um, like um, imagination about the uh, shape of the cornea within the six millimeter because Q value usually is expressed in six millimeter. So I have an idea about whether the, the cornea is um, steep, flat, prolate, uh, hyperprolate, oblate, something like this. So it may guide me to choose customized laser vision correction, for example, or optimized laser vision correction. How about uh, it is uh, not, uh, yeah. getting keratoconic? Does it tell you that actually this is a too steep cornea, for example, to be normal, despite I have a little evidence on the other uh, marks? You Parameters. Just, like, yeah. Now, um, Q value usually in keratoconus is above minus one, and usually is much higher than this. Of course, I cannot find Q value, which is minus two, for example, and a flat cornea. Mm -hmm. So there must be other criteria of keratoconus, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, of course, I have to see something on the elevation map, which is relevant to this Q value. I cannot find minus two, and um, there is no bulging on the elevation map. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. You have more? Uh, we can do one more, maybe. Just yeah. a question. So, are you going to wait before cross linking if corneal thickness is less than 450 microns and age is of 21 years old? And there's a probably typical corneal tomography for keratoconus. Yeah, 21, I will do a cross linking. Of course, I will not wait. 
Yeah. Okay. Did you go through this question on the chat? Uh, there's some more actually. Yeah, so there is a question. Uh, what is your experience with serious tomography? Very good experience. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is a question about uh, how to evaluate higher order aberrations in Pentagon, but um, I imagine that's a whole chapter on its own. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It is a Zernica analysis. We have to go to Zernica analysis. Yeah. Uh, there is a talk about one hour about this, only one this, about this. So, yeah. Um, about the age, I think we already discussed uh, the age and cross-linking and progression. And uh, there is a question, how would we say that the patient is myopic or hyperopic on anterior and posterior elevation map in corneal tomography? Hmm. To predict the refractive error uh, from the corneal tomography itself? A very good question. Uh, well, of course, we cannot predict uh, exactly because uh, the hyperopia, uh, uh, the refractive error does not depend only on cornea, it depends on the axial length and uh, on the lens itself, crystalline lens. But however, if the cornea is, uh, uh, the um, KM is above 43, then we may we may expect that the patient has myopia. If it is flat cornea, we may expect that the cornea, uh, that the patient has hypermetropia, although the, uh, it is not a, um, a rule of thumb, okay? Mm -hmm. We can see some cases of uh, uh, small eyes with very steep corneas because the, cor the diameter of the cornea is small and the cornea takes a very steep curvature and the patient is hypermetropic because the, the eye is very short. Mm -hmm. So there is no rule of thumb. Of course. Um, can, can I just finish with that question, uh, if you allow me, Artemis? The, um, so I think the age keep coming on those questions, to be honest. There's a lot of questions about age, make decision making related to the age. Can you just give us, finish with telling us, how would age affect your interpretation? Because it's all today about interpreting the topography and guiding your management. So one is how the age, and one question here say, so how many, if you treated cross-linking, how many times can you repeat that cross-linking? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Now for the age, uh, I, I think the question is related to correct colors, right? Yes, yes. Okay, great. If the patient is 20 years old or, or below, okay, or younger, then definitely I will go for uh, cross-linking. I will not wait, I will not observe, all mm -hmm. right? If the patient is between 20 and 30, I will look about other criteria. For example, if it is thin cornea, 420, 430, 410. Uh, if the, the patient gives me um, a history of uh, progressive loss of vision, uh, increase of numbers, mm -hmm. uh, changing of glasses. Mm -hmm. uh, if the high order abrasions are high, uh, advanced keratoconus, for example, not advanced, uh, I mean moderately advanced keratoconus. So in this case, no need to, to wait as well. Uh, we can go for cross-linking. Uh, but if the cornea is very thick, uh, relatively thick, let's say, for example, uh, above 450, and uh, the patient is giving me stable refraction, uh, history of stable refraction. So in this case, why to rush to coronal cross-linking? I may observe. Maybe I will um, do close uh, follow-ups every three months, for example, rather than six months. Mm -hmm. And if the patient is above 30, definitely I wait to document progression. Okay. Now, after cross-linking, um, I don't know whether you ha we have just five minutes to show you the slides of how to monitor patient after cross-linking. Yeah, okay. Do we have, do we have five minutes? Yeah, yeah, please. Great. Let so me what, share. Is it yes, ready I'm slides? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, good. It is the same presentation, but I skipped oh, okay. uh, the slides. Okay. Oh, nice. uh, okay.
did, did you say anything? Uh, did, I'm not sure, Artemis, if you asked the question about the bad uh, D. No. So uh, we had a chat again about the bad D, actually. Um, what's, your, what's your view on, on the Bill and Ambrosio bad D progression analysis? Uh, actually, uh, it is a very good uh, tool in order just to have an idea, but I don't depend on because it has false positives and false negatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the display has false positives and false negatives. For example, false positives in large angle kappa, for example. All mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for the parameters, which is the D index, and uh, I, I, I studied a series of patients with keratoconus, and I found that sometimes. Um, after cross-linking, the patients are showing improvement in visual acuity, care readings, uh, regularity of the cornea, while the D-index is getting worse, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, uh, illogic. So I don't depend. Okay, excellent. Sorry, distracting yeah. from your slide. I don't yeah. We, yeah. yeah, now, um, just to highlight that, after cross-linking, care readings increase, usually increase by two to three diopters during the first three months. Then they decrease during the second three months, all right? And then they continue decreasing uh, for about uh, two to three diopters over the following one to two years, all right? Mm -hmm. So during the first six months, the cornea will show steepness because of cross-linking. Now we come to the second slide, which is thinning of the cornea after uh, cross-linking. As you see here, there is um, thinning of the cornea dur during the first three months, then gaining of the uh, thickness, uh, previous thickness, during the uh, second 12 months. So let's say that during the three to six months, the changes in the cornea are very similar to progression of keratoconus, right? Mm -hmm. The progression of keratoconus is increase of steepness and decrease in thickness. While after cross-linking, these two criteria are because of the cross-linking itself. So if we want to monitor a patient after cross-linking, we have to wait for six months and then we start monitoring. After six months, we start monitoring. All right. Excellent. Very, very good slide. I'm glad you put those slides, actually. <laughs> and I wish we have more optometrists with us today because, you know, some of the things we do in uh, NHS with treat patient keratoconus cross-linking, they've been uh, monitored by some local optometrist. And the first thing they do after three months, they call, they say, oh, this patient is failing. The treatment failed. Can you see them uh -huh. again? Because they're progressing quickly now. <laughs> and uh, we always know the answer. Well, no, we just... Uh, it's a case early to decide that you have to wait six months plus, etc. No, I'm really glad uh, you mentioned that. <clears throat> right. Okay. So uh, I think we <laughs> we went to to talk for an hour. It's been almost an hour and a half, and we had yeah. amazing audience. I have to say, one a very interactive audience and, uh, and a large okay. audience, both on on a Facebook and obviously here on uh, on a webinar and Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to you. Uh, Professor Mazin, a uh, great teacher, and this adds to your uh, 7,500 hours of <laughs> education and teaching. So yeah. really well, was great having you today. I think we learned Thank a lot you. from you. I personally learned a lot of you. Always nice talking to you, listen to you. You, you make things uh, simple and put things into the right criteria, make, make things easy to, to anyone to, to learn it from, from junior to, to more senior. So thank you for thank having you us. Much. We probably will have you again for some stage to talk about keratoconus because it looks like an interesting topic. A lot of people are asking about this topic today. Thank you again and um, have a good evening. And um, I'll pass back to Artemis. I think she has just an announcement to finish with. Uh, so I'll just, uh, if you bear with me. If you allow me, please, for, uh, sorry for interruption. If you of allow course. me, Dr. Samir, just, uh, just 30 seconds to announce for um, launching of sinjabacademy.org. Excellent. Uh, everybody is invited to visit this website, which I hope in the future will be uh, platform number one for ophthalmology education, mm -hmm. academic education. And um, uh, I'm, I'd like to announce about module one of uh, master class in refractive surgery. Module one is work up, diagnostics, and uh, everything we have to do before doing the 
refractive surgery. Uh, you are most, all most welcome to visit the website and uh, all the details are there. Thank you very much. So this, this details on your own website, uh, is that right? No, no, on uh, uh, sinjabacademy.org. Okay. Sinjabacademy.org. Yeah, excellent. Good. Right, thank you very much. Dr. Thank, you, thank you, great. And uh, well, I would also like to say thank you very much. And also for our younger colleagues, we may want to learn more about corneal tomography. Professor Sinjab is uh, the writer of many, many great books in this field. And I personally probably have all of them in my library. So I just wanted to mention that from uh, my point of view. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Uh, that was a great pleasure to have you all. And uh, just to uh, remind you of our next session, which is on Wednesday, the 10th of March. And uh, we will welcome Mr. Sheraz Daya for a very interesting talk on corneal sculpting and advanced lamellar surgery. Okay, thank you, thank you, Samir. Thank you, Artemis, for thank your thank kindness. You it was a great pleasure for me. And thanks for uh, the audience as well. Thanks. Thank the audience. Thanks, Artemis. Thanks, Mazin. Thank nice much. to see you tonight. Good night. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you for watching.